church as we know it is dying. It's been dying for a while. For the last 40 years that I've been paying attention to such information, the statistics have shown that religion and Christianity in particular in America is in decline. One of the statistics I remember seeing when I was young in ministry was that every year there were between 1,000 and 1,500 new church starts. Churches that are started in living rooms and in high school gymnasiums and auditoriums and theaters around the country. Adventures in starting a new ministry between 1,000 and 1,500 a year. But also, over the course of my ministry life, the average has been that every year 4,000 churches have closed their doors. The trends are undeniable as you measure the statistics throughout American history. For example, in 1955, a survey of American adults found that 71% of them identified as practicing Protestants, 1955. By 1970, that number had declined to 60%. 30 years later, in 2000, it was 54%. 2010, 51%. And the most recent statistics I saw this year was the first year in American history that people who identified as practicing Protestant Christians fell below half of the population at 48%. There are uh, surveys that say between 37 and 40% of Americans attend church weekly. But there was a Hartford Institute of Religion research study in 2017 that said that the, that information is not accurate because they measured the percentage of people who said they attended church weekly and then they measured a sample of how many people are actually in church. And it turns out that half the people lied on the survey. <laughs> Can you imagine that? These are people taking a survey of religious practices and they lied about how often they came to church. The actual numbers were almost half of the number of people who said they attended church weekly. Now that's not just a sad commentary on our pathological lying ability, it's also a sad commentary on the state of religion. That most people perceive religion and the practice of Christianity to be something they ought to do or are supposed to do and that it's guided by rules and obligations. I think this is why we are seeing a decreasing trend in the activity and the churches in America. For example, in 1900, there were 27 churches for every 10,000 people. A hundred years later, in the year 2000, there were only 11 churches per 10,000 people. I realize that some of that can be explained by the changing demographics between 1900 and 2000. The invention of the car alone changed people's habits on Sundays. They didn't have to go to the church in their community. They could go to the better church around the corner. And the, and the increasing migration from agricultural areas and rural populations into the cities meant denser populations and fewer churches. But still, that's a frightening statistic that the church in America is dying, and probably the most troubling evidence is the fastest growing identified religious group in America are people who identify themselves as unaffiliated. Statistically, they are referred to as the nuns, and we're not talking the flying nun, we're not talking women who uh, devote their lives to service in, in the Catholic Church. We're talking about people who self-identify as having no religious affiliation whatsoever. For most of the history of America, for since the, since the question was asked, the, the percentage of people who identified as unaffiliated was always in single digits. In 1977, it was 7%. In 1987, that had remained 7%. But by 1997, it had almost doubled to 12%. In 2007, it had increased to 16%. And last year, in a national survey, 24%, one in four people, a quarter of our population, identified themselves as unaffiliated religiously or spiritually.
Now, that's an amazing growth in the segment of our population that identifies themselves as unassociated or unaffiliated with religion. But the most shocking statistic is the growth of that segment of the population among millennials and younger Gen Xers. In, among, among young adults between 18 and 35, the percentages are growing every year. Those between 30 and 35, a third of Americans, 30%, identify themselves as unaffiliated. But if you look at the 21 to 29 year old age group, then it's 33%. Among 18 to 20 year olds, the number jumps to 38%. For comparison, in the same age group in 1955, 75% of the adults between 18 and 35 identified themselves as practicing Christians. In 2017, that number is 25%. 1970, it said that 3% of the population was raised in unaffiliated households. 40 years later, in 2010, that number had grown to 8%. But the most shocking statistic was that the 2017 Pew Research Center for Religion and Ethics found that 74%, two-thirds, of the people, of the young adults who identified themselves as unaffiliated were raised in church-going homes, are in our children's programs today. Three quarters of that generation were raised in church. We're losing an entire generation. And I couldn't be more excited. I am excited because this is an opportunity. I am excited to be alive doing what we are doing in this moment. This is a watershed moment in the history of the church in America. And not only am I excited that I get to be alive in this time, in this time of, of great demand for, for a revitalized version of Christianity, I'm excited to be involved in this church because I believe that the DNA of this church equips us perfectly for the rising change in the spiritual expectations and commitments of future generations. I'm not just blindly optimistic about this. I am convinced that the church in America, and especially this church, can not only survive this dynamic cultural shift, but thrive if we are willing to do one thing. But before we talk about what that one thing is, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us to hold on to our religion loosely, but to hold on to you very tightly. Pray that we would know the difference and commit accordingly. Pray that for myself and for my family and for all of us here, for I ask that. In Jesus' name, amen. By every standard matrix of success, however you measure success, the converted rabbi, Saul of Tarsus, was hardly a successful person. He had been, Saul of Tarsus, in his rabbinical trajectory, a quite successful person. He was making his way up the ranks of the religious establishment and was bound for, destined for fame and wealth and influence in his community. But it was in 34 AD that God interrupted the order of his life and disordered his heart. He interrupted him on the road to Damascus and there he changed from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. The trajectory of his life also changed, not a trajectory of increasing influence as a rabbinical leader and scholar, but now his trajectory began to descend into greatness, where he was becoming increasingly enamored with, increasingly compelled by the transformation that was taking place in his life.
But even that descent into greatness did not call much attention to itself. For 14 years after his Damascus Road experience, which was in 34 AD, the Apostle Paul studied and taught and worked and, and, and gave himself to the service of the church, but we know very little about it. Most of what he did is not memorable, inconsequential. It wasn't until 14 years later in 48 AD that he finally was commissioned to go on what would become 12 years of missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire. He spent 12 years on three missionary journeys sharing the architecture of grace and the gospel of Christ with most of the known world. It was in uh, 50, 56 AD that the Apostle Paul was traveling through Upper Macedonia and he wrote a letter, a second letter, to the church in Corinth in Greece. And it was there that he described the years following his Damascus Road experience. See if this sounds like the description of a successful life. I have worked harder, put in, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced dangers from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold, without enough clothing to keep me warm. How is that for a trajectory of success? But Paul's descent into greatness was taking him to a place of great interrogation of his soul. And after the letter that he wrote in Corinthians, he made his way down to Jerusalem so that on June the 2nd, 57 AD, he appeared before his former colleagues, the Sanhedrin. They had charged him with treason against the Jewish religion. But he pled his case as a Roman citizen, and when they realized that they could not convict him and condemn him to death, they sent him to Caesarea Philippi on the coast of Israel. And there he spent two years waiting to appear before the Roman bureaucrats and the procurators and the governors. It was finally in 59 AD that the Apostle Paul set sail for Rome to make his appeal to Caesar. He traveled throughout the Mediterranean, arriving in Crete in October of 59 AD. When the captain of the ship said, we are going to sail across the open Mediterranean in the middle of the winter, the Apostle Paul, who had already been shipwrecked three times, and according to his own words, had spent a day and a night alone at sea, thought that that was a really bad idea. The Roman captain said, we will set sail, and sure enough, they set sail across the Mediterranean for Rome and ran into a terrifying storm. This is the navigational representation of a terrifying storm. <laughs> they wound up shipwrecked on the Isle of Malta in October of 59 AD. They spent the winter there, and in the spring of 60 AD, they made their way to Rome, where Paul was placed under house arrest, and he would remain for two years. After all of these adventures, after all of these trials, after all of this, this pathway descending into greatness, he heard that the church that he had started in the city of Ephesus was tearing itself apart, and he wrote them a letter. We have that letter preserved in our Bible as the book of Ephesians. And it's in Ephesians chapter 3 that we see the Apostle Paul continuing his descent into greatness. No longer the Hebrew of Hebrews, not even the way he had described himself years earlier as the least of the apostles. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8, he describes himself as less than the least of all of God's people. This was the man who was the Hebrew of Hebrews. And then he was the least of the best, the least of the apostles. Now, 
four years later, he sees himself as the least of the rest of us. It is this journey that the Apostle Paul is on that all of us go on. It's not a geographical journey. It's an inward journey. It is a journey that when we stop focusing on the external and insignificant parts of our life, takes us into an examination of our own spirit and our own soul. Who am I? Why do I do the things that I do? This is that descent into greatness that Paul was on. But you don't stay in this place where all you do is contemplate and interrogate your own soul. It begins to resurrect itself in how you relate to those around you. It changes how you see yourself, which then changes how we see others. And what the Apostle Paul realized as he was sitting in a prison cell in Rome writing to the Ephesian church was the most important thing in the DNA of any church in any age. It is the DNA that has kept the church vital in every culture, in every age, for over 2,000 years. It is the DNA that will keep this church vital in a dramatically changing spiritual culture. And it is the simple DNA that says, this church is not here for me. This church is here for others. This church is not here to make me comfortable. This place does not exist so that I can find a cruise ship and sail off to heaven. This church exists so that we can represent our faith well to each other and to others. It doesn't exist for me. It exists for those who have yet to find it. It exists for those who have yet to be born. It's this transformational viewpoint that says, it's not here for my comfort. And I know how hard this is. This is really, really difficult because we need a refuge. We want this place to be a place that matters to us, that restores our soul, that feeds our spirit, that gives us a shelter in the storm. We want to walk in and we want to see familiar faces. We want to hear familiar voices. We want to sing familiar songs. Because this is the one place in our life that shouldn't change. Because you know what else changes outside? Everything. And so we long for this place to be a place of comfort and for this place to be a place of refuge and a place of safety. But it's not about us. We find here that refuge and that safety in representing our faith to the needs of others. That's the one thing. The one thing that will cause any church, that has caused the church for 2,000 years, that will cause this church not just to survive but to thrive, is that if we remember that this is not here for us, it's here for others. Everything we pray, everything we say, everything we sing, everything we do is to make our faith real to those around us. I know, if you're super spiritual, you're saying, well, Dave, the church should be about Jesus. That should be what we're about. Well, let me tell you that what Jesus was about was others. And Jesus says, if you love me and you hate your neighbor, you're a liar. So the reality is we express our faith by caring for the needs of those among us and those around us. And it's the vitality and the reality of that that people are craving and searching for and groping for in the dark. This is what we are called to be. This is what we are fashioned to be. This is part of our DNA. You see, the church has to die because we are a people of resurrection and you cannot have a resurrection without death and every generation has to evaluate the forms and the practices of their parents and their predecessors church and say this works for me and this doesn't and they have to be given the permission to do that 
This generation has to give permission to the next generation to give permission to the generation behind them so that they can focus not on their own needs, but on the needs of others. You see, if we build a church for people who are dying, we shouldn't be surprised when it dies. But if we build a church for people who are not here yet, who have not yet discovered the hope that can sustain them in the storms of life, if we build a church for those who are not born yet, it will live. I don't think there's anyone here, is there? Who would say, you know what I want to do? You know what, I want to build a comfortable place for me. I want it to be about me. I want to sing the songs I like. I want to do the things I like. I want to see the people I like. And I really don't care if my children don't like it. I don't care if my children find value in the faith of their fathers. I don't care about my children or my grandchildren. Is there anybody here who would actually say that? Well, if we really care about generations yet to be born, we should be about the business of building this place for them, putting them on our shoulders and saying, you reach higher and you pay forward that DNA because we showed you that it's not about us, it's about you. You show the next generation that it's not about you, it's about them. This is the journey that the Apostle Paul was on. This is that inward journey. And we don't do this. We don't do this out of obligation. We don't do this out of guilt. We do this because of grace. You know, as the Apostle Paul sat in house arrest in Rome, in the early part of 60 AD, he got a report from his home church in Ephesus that the church was being, being torn apart by two groups of people. There was a group of Messianic Jews who believed that in order to be a true follower of Christ, you had to keep the law, which meant you had to be circumcised, which meant you couldn't have ham and cheese sandwiches or play tennis on Saturdays. And they saw themselves as people who were superior spiritually because of the traditions that they maintained. But the church was also populated with people who had come in out of Roman pagan culture, people who, nothing, who knew nothing of the law. And, and so the church was, was divided between these Messianic Jews and these Gentile Christians. And they were arguing over which of them was superior. And the Apostle Paul lost his mind. And he said, don't you understand anything about grace? He wrote them a letter. And it's the letter that we have preserved for us. And it's called the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians, what we have is Ephesians chapter 2. He says, don't you understand? All of you were dead. Before Christ found you, you were dead. You were hopeless. It didn't matter whether you were a Jew or a pagan Gentile. It didn't matter. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And then he says, but by grace we have been saved through faith. And it's not of works. It's not, it's not anything we've accomplished so that none of us can take credit for it. You see, it's the gift of God. And if we understand that God's grace is a gift, then we understand we have work to do. And it says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship individually and we are his workmanship corporately to share that grace, to share that gift with everyone around us. That is why we exist. He goes on in the rest of Ephesians chapter 2 in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 3 to, to, to build out the architecture of grace to try and unify this church in this DNA of that others matter more than ourselves. This other-centered theology, this grace theology. And when he comes to chapter 3, he says this was God's plan all along. It was God's plan to have the Jews and the Gentiles, to have the pagans and the, and the religious people come together in Christ and to be a blessing to one another. This was always God's plan. And this is where he then says, and I am the least likely person to champion that message. I am the leastest of all the apostles. The word that he uses there is Ella Kistos. And he actually, he actually uses a word called Ella which is a word he made up, which means the leastest. <laughs> 
It's like the trivialist. It's like the most insignificantist. He's trying to say that, that of all of the people who have ever lived, I am the least likely person, the least qualified person to champion this other-centered theology because I began my journey as the Hebrew of Hebrews. I began my journey out here in this self-righteous place until God interrupted my order and I had to reorder my private world and I had to understand who I really was in Christ. I had to understand why I do the things I do, why I feel the things I do. And because of that grace, I can now be a servant of others. I can now embrace us. This is the one thing. The one thing that we have to do, and it's a hard thing. It's a really hard thing. Because that means the forms and the practices that mean so much to us, we have to hold them with an open hand. We have to drive our tent stakes in shallow. Because what matters is not whether or not we are comfortable, but whether or not others find the hope and the grace and the faith and the love that we have found. This is the one thing. This is the one thing that I am most excited about, that I believe will cause this church and the church not just to survive, but to thrive. But there's evidence that, that this shift away from institutional Christianity is not a shift away from faith. It's interesting that most of the people who identify themselves as unaffiliated or as nuns do not consider themselves to be atheists. They consider themselves to be spiritual people. In fact, of the 46 million unaffiliated young adults, they, 46 million, 68% of them consider themselves to be religious or spiritual in some way and believe in God or some kind of higher power. Two thirds of the unaffiliated are looking for the grace that we have found. 58% say they find a deep connection with God in nature. They know. They know there's more. 37% say they are spiritual, but not religious. And shockingly enough, one in five, 21%, say they pray every day. I believe we live in a world that even though statistically looks like it, it is abandoning the church, is not abandoning a quest for faith. And I believe we are perfectly positioned to be a community of people that get that. That say, I understand that. Come on the journey with us. And we can help you and you can help us discover a God who loves you. The church is dying. And that's a good thing. Because we are a people of the resurrection. And the church has to die to be resurrected. So I say, the church is dead. Long live the church.